Well, this is uh, you know our final lunch uh, uh, program, uh, and it seems like uh, every lunch program prior to this referred to this in some way uh, about the hypoxic situation and, and that type of thing. And so it, it was a uh, when we were trying to put the summit together, uh, it was clearly a topic we wanted to address. We had not put it in the panels, and I wanted to make sure we we did, and particularly the issue that, as you see in the announcement, dealing with uh, with ethanol and, and the issues with ethanol associated with uh, epoxy in the Gulf. Now, I do have a financial disclaimer I have to make about my participation in this, because I do have a financial stake in it. As many of you know, I, uh, I'm, I'm, I have owned a number of boats in my lifetime and sunk a few. <laughs> but uh, the one, uh, the, one of the last one, I, I finally bought a new boat uh, just uh, a year and a half ago. It's, not, uh, it's a Yamaha, nice four-stroke, beautiful little outboard motor. But it, uh, in all honesty, it really is the last investment I want to make because those stinking things are so high, I can't afford to buy another one. But they're wonderful motors. The reason I had to do that is because my previous motor burned up. And the reason it burned up, I'm told, is frankly because of the ethanol level. It finally, it finally got to it. And it has done that in many ways. And, and so I, I was um, on a, um, a congressional panel uh, not, oh, not too long ago on this very topic. I was really filling in for Nancy when, when she was indisposed, but fortunately she's back on the tracks now and, and uh, we, we appreciate her, uh, her zeal and, and, and uh, focus on the hypoxia, which is really an important issue. But anyway, I was on the panel and the, the uh, farmer, a farmer president of Yamaha Motors uh, was there too. And, and it really got my attention when he was, he was talking about, and this is not related to environmental issues, but the whole, another point that the whole engine business, uh, the concern, the fact that now all of our engines, the small, the closed loop engines, basically outboard motors, lawnmowers and all that, um, they are now, they can run on the 10% ethanol, and they've been re-engineered to do that. Uh, but with the uh, increasing standards, uh, they were discussing, uh, trying to figure out how they could meet a 20% ethanol or anything in that range, and he uh, talked about the fact that they had run a whole series of tests with existing uh, outboard engines on, the, on that higher standard. I think he had said they had 10 of them, they ran through their test, uh, test system, and nine of them failed uh, within a week and a half, and one of them would have probably exploded except they had it on the instruments because it was that bad. So I got my attention from that. So my financial stake is there's an issue here with, with ethanol, but that's a whole other, other deal. The real concern, uh, and, and I think, and, I, and we have two really great experts here uh, to talk with us uh, about it, uh, is that, that really gets to me on this, is that we have a, a, a policy dealing with ethanol, which is really well intended, obviously, and, and, and understand where it came from for sure. But the, as the title talks about, is that part of the, these unintended consequences of, of, of a well-intended uh, federal policy, where on one hand we're promoting and pushing a federal policy uh, to reduce our, our dependence on foreign oil, but at the same time the consequences of that particular policy um, uh, is, is having a, a tremendous and can have a tremendous effect on the Gulf of Mexico. So you have these conflicting goals and. And we really need to address this issue and come forward with how do we resolve this and solve this because we're not doing it right now. Uh, and it's becoming more and more critical that we do, uh, as, the, as our speakers will talk about. But I want to introduce first uh, someone who really doesn't need a, an introduction to this audience or anyone in the Gulf of Mexico, Dr. Nancy Rabelais. If there's an iconic figure person in the Gulf, that's, that's Nancy. Uh, and this is one of her, her topics, her expert one of her many areas of expertise, but passion as well. So will you please uh, join me in welcoming in, uh, Dr. Nancy Rabelais. Uh, thank you, Larry, for having me here today. Um, if I didn't sound so much like a frog, you could hear the Texas accent under this voice, but, and by the way, Conoco is uh, one brand of gasoline you can get that does not have ethanol in it. So, yeah. So I've been asked to talk about ethanol and hypoxia, both of us have been, and um, <clears throat> I'll just get right into it. So ethanol is a chemical. It's got two carbons. It's also known as, as ethyl alcohol. And um, many of us who grew up identifying benthic organisms know it's uh, what you put your specimens in to keep them long term into the laboratory. Some of you know ethanol as um, <clears throat> a, a, more, a more common commodity um, and uh, even some maybe some less common concoctions such as um, 
what I see somebody doing um, with their, uh, what was a good um, Corona. Okay. Ethanol is also, as uh, we've been talking about, a biofuel and something that has been developed from corn primarily. Other things can uh, be used to um, <clears throat> make ethanol, such as uh, sugar cane, the, and um, <clears throat> also um, other grasses and other things. Uh, cellulosic ethanol is very often heard of. But you can also see that the whoops that the um, <clears throat> the percentage of the corn that's grown in the U.S. that's being uh, transferred into ethanol now has increased substantially with the energy policy to put uh, ethanol as a <clears throat> as a way to conserve our uh, petroleum uh, products. And that uh, with this demand, there's also been an increase in the price of corn. So it's been very, um, it's been a good incentive for people who have farmland to convert, if they haven't converted, convert not just from a, a, um, <clears throat> a soybean corn rotation, but to an entirely corn uh, crop. And uh, as you can see, the amount of corn that has uh, increased is primarily in the middle of the United States and up at the upper end of the Mississippi River Gulf of Mexico, because I consider the watershed in the Gulf to be a continuum of ecosystems. <clears throat> so, okay, but ethanol is not all that it's promised to be. You actually get poor gas mileage, maybe burn up your boat motors. You get uh, poor gas mileage. They really aren't as uh, eco-friendly as many people have uh, made them to be, and there's a lot of research now that shows that they generate more um, <clears throat> ozone than regular gasoline. It actually requires more energy overall to produce ethanol than the energy that you get from it. It requires a lot of water, and if you went through the droughts in um, the upper Midwest over the last several years, you know that uh, water is also a very uh, dear commodity to the people that are growing the corn. The cropland is encroaching into much less desirable areas uh, with regard to erosion and things like that, and we'll hear more about that in a minute. <clears throat> And to, grow, and to grow good corn, you've got to have well-drained land, and you have to apply um, an adequate amount of fertilizer to make it grow. <clears throat> and um, it's the fertilizer issue that um, we get into some of the complications with what's going on in the Gulf of Mexico. So the gist of this talk is the more ethanol, the more nutrients in the form of nitrogen and phosphorus, the more phytoplankton grow, the more carbon reaches the bottom, and we develop more hypoxia. Now I defined what ethanol is. Hypoxia <clears throat> is low oxygen, and it's oxygen below the level that most organisms need to survive. Uh, in the ocean, that's about two milligrams per liter and fish and shrimp will move out of the area if they, if they can, and things that live in the, in the sediments cannot, and um, they eventually die, and the biodiversity is, is quite um, contracted. So I was one of those people many years ago who was picking those poor little benthic worms out of the mud after it had been blasted with a hose on the back deck of the, the Longhorn at the time and putting them in little vials of ethanol. That's way before I knew anything about the other ethanol products. That <clears throat> but this is the Mississippi River plume, mostly the sediments uh, entering into the Gulf of Mexico. And um, it makes a significant difference on the quality of the water in the Gulf. Over the years, since the 1950s, the amount of fertilizer that's been applied to the cropland in the watershed has increased substantially. The other 
factors. It's an agricultural watershed, so a human uses, wastewater, uh, atmospheric deposition, they're all <clears throat> much less than the agricultural practices and inputs into the Gulf um, that make the difference. So if you're looking at solutions, you need to look at all the inputs, and you also have to look at those that might be the most um, bang for your buck. <clears throat> As I mentioned, um, most of the uh, Midwest in the upper part of the Mississippi River watershed um, produces most of the nitrogen. And as you can see from this, it's mostly from a corn and soybean rotation. And then other parts, um, other crops, there is an atmospheric deposition contribution to nitrogen, uh, not much from the cities, as you can see, both for phosphorus. And phosphorus as well, uh, not as much in the, core bean, in the corn and soybean rotation, uh, but a lot from pasture land as well. And the reason we look at nitrogen and phosphorus the most <clears throat> is because they're the nutrients that uh, both stimulate the growth of corn and they also stimulate the growth of the phytoplankton in the Gulf of Mexico. So over the years, as these inputs have increased, the amount of <clears throat> nitrogen getting to the Gulf of Mexico has increased 300%. And only 20% of that can be attributed to the discharge of the Mississippi River, and the rest of it uh, due to the increase in the nitrogen concentration, which is shown, whoops, which is shown over here. And if you went back to the 1950s, it'd be down here. There's been a slight increase in total phosphorus. Uh, doesn't really look like orthophosphate is increased much. And the discharge has mainly uh, been about the same. So the numbers of nitrogen getting to the Gulf go up and down with the discharge. But it's that really high concentration that we've been maintaining over many years now that's uh, part of the problem. <clears throat> If you look at the best predictor for the size of low oxygen in the Gulf of Mexico in the summer, it would be the nitrate load in the spring, primarily May, that can um, predict the size of the area of low oxygen. And you can see here from the predicted model and the actual determination of the size, which we've been doing for um, 29 years now. This summer will be our 30th cruise. Um, talk to your Congress people about the need for NOAA to let more money out the door into uh, hypoxia work because the Gulf of Mexico program and NOAA are making this last effort this summer to try to pull this together. <clears throat> Phosphorus is also an indicator, but not as strong an indicator as nitrogen. Oops. So when you put more nitrogen and phosphorus into the Gulf of Mexico, you enhance the growth of phytoplankton. This particular phytoplankton bloom is in 2011. Unfortunately, it's, a, it's heterosigma, which is a toxic, harmful algal bloom, but it's also a source of a lot of carbon. And if you, um, you need both nitrogen and phosphorus for these phytoplankton to, to bloom, but nitrogen alone um, produces more phytoplankton than phosphorus alone. So, but it's, it's a combination of both, and water management needs to address both of these uh, nutrients in water management. So it all falls into the area between the <clears throat> Mississippi Delta. This is a, a sediment plume picture and the Atchafalaya River, which carries about 30% of the water of the Mississippi River. During the spring, sorry, during the spring, most of the water moves to the west and impacts uh, not only Louisiana, but also Texas. And there's been more and more uh, incidences of hypoxia to the east of the river as well, particularly during flood years. Even though the flow is down in the summer, the winds shift and it holds that water mass <clears throat> which is stratified with uh, saltier, warmer water on the top and colder, uh, I'm sorry, warmer, less salty water on the surface and colder, more saline water on the bottom. 
and you get a layered system so you don't have the mixing of the oxygen and you get hypoxia developing in the bottom. So it can be a very large area, up to about 20,000 square kilometers. Uh, it's about the largest we've measured it. And uh, in state sizes, because we always like to say what it's compared to, it's about the size of the state of New Jersey. And when Christine Todd Whitman, who was the governor of New Jersey before she became the director of the EPA, stood up at a meeting and said, I would really like for somebody else to take over the premier you know, state comparison for the size of the dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico. <laughs> but it did get her attention um, because the hypoxia task plan, which called for an environmental goal, hit uh, President Clinton's desk and then Governor, um, Governor Bush, now President Bush, the second desk, and um, she was instrumental in um, re-implementing the task force and making sure that this issue was continued on. So it's from very close to shore. You can see here it gets uh, down past Galveston at times. And uh, it's in water depths of about 10, well, five meters. This is about as shallow as the captain of the Pelican will let me take the research vessel Pelican close to shore, but sometimes it's right up against the beach. <clears throat> so it's a very large area where animals just really can't live uh, at the bottom. <clears throat> and so there are some consequences. There are some fisheries at risk. Uh, sometimes these water masses hit the beach and kill the fish, and because these are typical benthic fish, stingrays and redfish. Um, they shouldn't be washing up on, it's not a pogey net loss. Um, and all the things I love and care about, the worms and the invertebrates, they eventually die off. And there are some indications of some decadal decreases in brown shrimp landings, which can be due to many things besides hypoxia, but it could be one of the uh, forces at work. This map from Kevin Craig from many years ago shows the area of low oxygen, and most of the Atlantic croaker, which makes up the biomass of the shrimp trawls, is offshore, and most of the brown shrimp are near shore. And what happens when these brown shrimp are captured near shore, they don't migrate across this area, and they don't have the potential to grow to a larger size. So while we may not be seeing the economic smoking gun, we do know that we're losing production from at least the brown shrimp in this area. <clears throat> and over the years, the area has, um, when, when I started the work, it was, uh, you know, five to 10,000 square kilometers. And we thought that with bringing down the nitrogen load by about 30%, we could make a difference and, and reach a 5,000 square kilometer area. But the since then, the amount of nitrogen has gone up, along with the phosphorus. And this environmental goal is now um, pretty far away from what we've been uh, measuring over the last several, several, almost decades now since I've been doing this. And uh, it calls for um, more tension in the upper part of the country where this the solution to pollution is in those streams, not in the Gulf of Mexico or not in Louisiana. <clears throat> and there are a lot of ways that this can be done, um, all kinds of best management practices, and we're gonna hear some more about that from uh, um, Dr. Riddleman. So um, the red dots are a little hard to see, but there are more and more hypoxic areas around the globe, and this is an increasing trend. There's about 550 that have been documented now. And we've moved the symptoms of this excess nitrogen and phosphorus from where we are right now into developing countries as they also want to develop and have the same things we do and eat as well as we do and have as much energy production as we do. And many of these countries now are converting their crops to corn and especially in very erodible land and contributing to the problem. So um, as it turns out, wait, wait, um, uh, biofuels, biofuels may be worse for global warming. Um, and down here, 
Tolls always has somebody that's making a second comment here. Don't you care about the science? And the passenger here says, guess. And then corn chip guy here, Mr. Frito Lay, has to make a decision as to whether that corn's going to go into food or whether it's going to go into a biofuel and support our um, energy demands. And this little bitty voice down here says, can I win for losing? And the idea is that we hope we all can win from this. There will have to be some trade-offs. And um, it's up to all of us that contribute to this excess carbon in the world to um, try to do something about it. And we'll hear about some more specific things now, I believe. I appreciate that very much, Nancy. And now we're going to hear from someone whom you may not be familiar with uh, because he's uh, from way up in the mid, far Midwest and uh, country up there. And, and you may have made up and say, I don't think too many people live in the Dakotas and those areas, but you're one of them, so that's great. Dr. Uh, Jim Ringelman. Jim's a uh, uh, former director of conservation programs at Great Plains Regional Office for Ducks Unlimited. He spent 32 years working throughout uh, the Midwest and the upper uh, a mid-continent area on waterfowl issues and those types of things and, and knows firsthand about the, the situation from the other end uh, of the spectrum. He has uh, subsequently retired from um, all these activities. He now leads the life of a writer and a photographer and a consultant living in Bismarck, North Dakota. So please join me in welcoming uh, Dr. John Ringelman. Well, thank you, everyone. It's good to be here. I want to thank the Hart Institute for inviting me to come out and speak. It was nine degrees uh, when I left home yesterday, so they didn't have to twist my arm too terribly hard. I also want to apologize for my rather informal attire. Somewhere in the 1,400 miles between Bismarck, North Dakota, and here, Delta Airlines managed to misplace my baggage. Um, to the point of what I'm going to talk about today, I wish that 1,400 miles insulated you from the land use changes going up in my country, but it doesn't. And that's what I want to talk to you about. We are, we are the new Corn Belt, the Western Corn Belt, as it's been called, and I'd like to talk a little bit about why that is. Just a bit of a recap, the renewable fuels policy had its origin in the, in the uh, Energy Policy Act of 2005. You may recall discussions about overdependence on foreign oil and, and uh, the need to, to address some of these other issues. So uh, the renewable fuel standard set some goals for blending ethanol with, uh, with gasoline. And, you can see there, kind of at three-year intervals, they would ramp up. In 2007, um, uh, Congress uh, reconsidered the standards and actually increased uh, the, uh, the objectives. And uh, in truth, what's happened is nearly all the, the ethanol has come from corn. Uh, cellulosic sources never really have gotten off the ground. And so we're talking largely of something like 93% of the ethanol supply coming from corn. Well, this policy had an immediate effect, of course. It was successful in terms of ethanol production. You can see in 2005 how it just launched in terms of uh, the amount of ethanol produced. Imports were essentially zero because there's a heavy tariff imposed on imports of ethanol. So our ethanol is, is homegrown. Um, naturally, to get this ethanol, U.S. corn acres expanded very dramatically. You can again see the inflection point in 05 when this policy came into effect. Farmers responded. Um, and, and corn grew. Where did these corn acres come from? Well, it turns out, as I mentioned before, those, those two rectangles kind of at the top center of the country, North and South Dakota, were kind of ground zero for moving additional corn acres into the country. And you can see on this kind of stack bar graph how acres jumped. And, and in fact, between 05 and uh, 2013, there's a 72% increase in the corn acres in North and South Dakota. If you look more specifically at where these acres came in, I can show you. This is in 2002, before, before these policies, before the boom. And you can see, yeah, there were some corn acres there, but it's pretty lightly shaded. Fast forward to 2012, and you can see this big change. Lots of corn came in. Uh, it, was, it was really the new crop for our part of the world. Now, the bad news for those of us concerned about hypoxia is this is an area before that was kind of out of mind. I've, I put the, the oval here in an area that depicts total phosphorus into the, the uh, Mississippi watershed. And you can see it's pretty lightly cutter, colored. It wasn't a big issue. Uh, same with nitrogen. Most of the concern was kind of south and east of, of this area. So it's additive. It's incremental to a lot of the things that have been going on. 
Well, where do the acres actually come from? That is, did they replace other crops? There was a very interesting analysis done by uh, researchers at South Dakota State University that looked at conversion of grassland habitat to corn or soybeans in the period between 2006 and 2011. And this map depicts their findings. The hotter colors depict just more uh, dramatic shifts from grassland to corn or soy. And it, it amounts to about 2 million acres of grassland having been plowed up between 2006 and 2011. Two million acres, that's, that's a big mark on the landscape. It, it, it's a rate of grassland loss, these authors said, has not been seen since the 1920s and the 1930s, which is the advent of big kind of mechanized agriculture in our country. They came from, the, the grass was lost in two areas. One was from the Conservation Reserve Program. This is a, this is a USDA program that was very popular uh, in the Dakotas. It basically paid farmers to restore grassland on former cropland. And it was targeted to areas that were either highly erodible soils or areas that had kind of exceptional wildlife values. Um, so it went from a crop field that was fertilized uh, periodically during the year to an idled grassland state that had multiple benefits. Among them, the ability to filter nutrients if they were positioned, if the grass was positioned properly in the landscape, it could intercept runoff and filter out nutrients from farm fields and those kinds of things. That, that land is going away. Here's a graph that shows the historic and kind of projected acres of CRP in that landscape. And, you know, we're here in 2014. At one point, if you look at the Prairie Pothole region, which includes the Dakotas, parts of Minnesota, Iowa, and Montana, there was over 8 million acres of CRP in this landscape. Uh, now we're down to about half of that. And as these contracts come out of enrollment, it's not attractive to landowners to re-enroll in this program. And so the projection is for virtually these acres to go to zero, zero, as you can see there by 2026, unless there's some radical policy changes that kind of even the playing field. The other place it's coming from, these acres are coming from, is native prairie grassland. And that's, that's a bit of an anomaly in most places of the world. There's not much grassland that's been there since the glaciers retreated 10,000 years ago. But in the Prairie Pothole region, there's actually some of this stuff still in place. It's a globally imperiled biome and that most grassland has already been lost across the world, especially most temperate grassland. Uh, it's also a huge carbon sink. Uh, the soil organic carbon is, is there. As soon as that, that soil is plowed up, all of that volatilizes as CO2 into the atmosphere. So there are lots of ecological values to this native prairie, even greater than the values associated with CRP. Okay, well, what are the drivers of corn expansion? We pinned it on the renewable fuel standard and ethanol, and that's, that's a big, big driver. But I want to point out there's some other things, too. Genetics has improved such that the corn now is drought tolerant and has a quicker maturation date. And if you think about the growing season in my country and the, and the droughty conditions, that allows it to expand kind of north and west from the traditional corn belt. Climate change has helped a lot. We've increased heating degree days and growing season in the Dakotas enough to make a difference where um, warm season crops like corn can actually do fairly well some years. Crop protection products, uh, classes of insecticides and pesticides are getting more effective at, at kind of increasing yield. Crop insurance is huge, and I, this is a whole lecture in itself, and I won't go into it, but suffice, su suffice to say the current crop insurance program is not so much now a protecting against disaster as guaranteeing revenue for farmers. And that's provided all kinds of incentives to do some things, take some risks they would not only do, not normally do in terms of planting corn on maybe marginal soil and that kind of thing. And then finally, profitability. I pulled some numbers from a, an analysis from North Dakota State University about net return per acre. This is after all expenses are covered for the year 2012. Corn is at $402 an acre in, in that year. And this is land that used to go for about $800 an acre. It doesn't go for that anymore, but it used to go for that. Compare that to the profitability of wheat at $138 an acre, or the annual payments made to CRP, $12 an acre. It's, it, yeah, it, it really is, I hear laughs. It's a no-brainer if you're, if, what a farmer's gonna do when his CRP comes out of enrollment. Well, of course, um, this is all a big driver of, of corn prices. You can see here, again, corn prices started going up pretty dramatically after uh, the renewable fuel standard came into place. There's interesting, there's a lot of disagreement among economists as to how much the renewable fuel standard and ethanol production from corn boosts the corn price. And you, you can read anywhere from 8 to 86 percent. A lot of them kind of settle in that 30 to 40 percent range. I don't need an economist to tell me. You can look at this graph and you can see there's a significant effect of the of, uh, renewable fuel standard, more corn ethanol on, on corn prices. 
The other interesting thing is how corn is being used. Uh, this graph, the, the top graph, the, the top green line is the feed, basically feed corn, and it's kind of stayed more or less steady, declined slightly. The red line that goes up like that, that's ethanol. And it's now to the point we're actually consuming as much or some, some years more corn to produce ethanol than the traditional use, which was uh, feed corn. So eventually this all impacts you, obviously. It, it flows downstream, as Nancy uh, mentioned and demonstrated quite well. These nutrients hit that Mississippi River system. They come down here, they contribute to the Gulf, and the nutrients are definitely a factor that connects our landscapes, my landscape and yours. But before I leave you, there's another factor I want to talk about, and, and that's the unique nature of this landscape for migratory birds. Um, many of you maybe have heard of the prairie pothole region. If you're a duck hunter, I expect you've heard about it because it's, it's the duck factory of North America. In addition to having large tracts of remaining grasslands, it has this wonderful matrix of about three million wetlands that attract all kinds of migratory birds. Um, migratory birds, as well as nutrients, connect the Gulf with the prairie pothole region. There are roughly 237 bird species that occur in the Gulf region. Uh, about 57%, 135 of those breed in the prairie pothole region. And these birds are dependent upon the wetlands and the, and the grasslands that are there. And when those are connected, converted to cropland, it affects those populations. And a lot of these populations are regulated actually by events that occur on the breeding grounds. In 2007, I actually wrote a story for Ducks Unlimited magazine about biofuels in ducks and how the two have the potential to clash. And unfortunately, I'm starting to see some of this come true. So what does the future hold? Well, corn is a global commodity, of course, and a lot of it depends on supply and demand. Um, if you look closely at this figure, you can see that the uh, stocks to use ratio, kind of a, the supply of corn in world markets declined actually before the renewable fuel standard came into place. But, but it's gotten worse since the renewable fuel standard. Meanwhile, demand keeps going up. Um, right now, U.S. ethanol is almost 11% of the world corn market. And that feeds back into all port important things related to food and, and other things that the global community cares about. So it's making a difference. So the question is, can we learn and adapt as a society? I don't think anyone set out to set a renewable fuel standard that was going to create hypoxia or devastate migratory bird populations or anything else. But we're seeing unintended consequences definitely occur. Um, it's renewable fuel standard is increasing the demand for corn, and it's pushing prices up. Uh, price and demand are driving land conversion at a very rapid pace, something we have not seen since the 1920s and 1930s. This conversion means more nitrogen and phosphorus coming down the watersheds, and it means less habitat for migratory birds. So the question is, are we going to learn and are we going to adapt? Thank you. We have time for a couple of questions or a comment if anybody has anything for, for our two speakers. Anything? Uh, no, Sylvia, of course, does. <laughs> what would it, please, yeah, there you go. So this is for both of you, I guess, but Nancy in particular. Isn't phosphorus in short supply globally, except where you don't want it? <laughs> right. There, there are some people who are just in cons concerned about the limited availability of phosphorus, but there are also a lot of phosphorus in these hypoxic areas is being buried in the sediment, so it's not completely going away. So, but, but you're right, and we need phosphorus for both corn and, and phytoplankton, and um, I'm not sure the trajectory on that, but it is a concern, yes. One more question. <laughs> this is a question for Jim. I can see a light here. I can't see. So we have two questions. Where is it? Oh, okay. Right here. All right. Uh, Jim, I, I handled Ducks Unlimited in Mexico. I was a CEO for 16 years, and I'm very worried about the duck situation and migratory waterfowl that come down to Mexico. Have you noticed that this situation that you talked about right now is actually decreasing the waterfowl population? We've uh, waterfowl are. are uh, somewhat unique in their ability to kind of move across the large swaths of landscape and utilize places that are wet and, and do fairly well. And we've had a series of wet years, and so we haven't really seen populations decline. But as a biologist, we know that their dependency on 
uh, wetland habitat and, and grasslands for nesting is really critical. And when you see the wetlands drained and the grasslands plowed, it's just a matter of time before it does catch up. But, so we haven't, seen the met, the, we haven't seen the numbers decline in terms of population, but we've seen the habitat and we, the handwriting is on the wall, basically, is what's going to happen. And I, I thought I was saw one last question here. Yeah, this is sort of basic. Um, I know there are several coastal counties that are non-ethanol counties. Uh, their fuels haven't been ethanized. And I was wondering, is it, is it to do with farming? Are they, is it for farm machinery that they're non-ethanol counties? But there are non-ethanol counties. I'm, I'm not aware of that at all. So I can't comment. I'm, I'm, yeah, but I live in Louisiana now. <laughs> this accent didn't go away when I moved east. <laughs> I, didn't, I wasn't aware of that. Either. I may have to take my boat to that. I, I will say in North Dakota, you cannot buy unleaded, regular unleaded gasoline anymore. Everything has ethanol in it, it's much to my consternation and my, my boat issues that I share with Larry. <laughs> okay. Well, today we, you know, we took you on a, on a, took you out of your geographic comfort zone a lot. I think you know we went to, to Mexico. Although for many of us, Mexico is. is uh, is a neighbor and a partner for maybe some of you there. We certainly took most of us out of our comfort zone when we went to Norway. And then we went to this alien landscape in North Dakota, which I'm probably sure Nona here knows about. But, but uh, and, and I appreciate it to give perspective. And, and one of the points of, of, of this presentation, obviously the issue we have to deal with here in the Gulf, but, but also in the broader sense of what we talked about here at the summit is as we go forward and, and looking at Restor Gulf restoration and the funds that we have to put, put toward it and the size and the scale of projects we may, we may undertake, the real need to take a look at those broad potential consequences, that they are science-based, that we truly evaluate what we think is a good thing because there sometimes can be unintended consequences and we don't want to see that, uh, that here. So this afternoon we're going to bring us back to our geographic comfort zone, Gulf of Mexico, and talk about where and how much and when. And so I appreciate you all staying with us through this uh, time, and we will see you upstairs shortly. Thank you. And give us a round of hand for our guests.